Hello, I am Bill or Billy Matthews. People are always confused when they ask me my name and I say Bill or Billy. They're like confounded at the, the, the fact that I've given them an option. Trust me, I'm just as confused as you are. Um, I work here at Trainline, I'm a web engineer. And naturally we love tests here at Trainline. We work with them every day on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I'd like to spend today to talk a little bit about sort of my opinion on how we can improve the tests that we write. First, a few disclaimers. I do advocate React testing library. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sponsored or affiliated with them in any way. Just thought I should say that. Um, also, I'm by no means an expert with React testing library. I don't use it in my day-to-day -day work. Um, I've used it in some of my side projects, personal projects. Um, but I am a big fan. Um, so this talk might be a little bit biased, a little bit opinionated. I do try to be as objective as possible. Um, I should also add that a lot of the content in this talk is actually just regurgitated from various blog posts by Kent C. Dodds. He's the author of React Testing Library. Um, so yeah, his blog posts, documentation, various other things. Um, and I'll include attributions in, in each slide. So what is React Testing Library? It's a simple testing library for testing React components. It encourages better testing practices. And its, it's primary guiding principle is this. Uh, the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. Um, this is taken from um, an article by Kent called Introducing the React Testing Library. Uh, he wrote this article a couple of weeks after writing React Testing Library, uh, which was middle of last year. Um, so yeah, the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. So React Testing Library, in a nutshell, gives us ways to query the DOM in the same way that a user would. Um, if you're familiar with Enzyme, actually hands up who's used Enzyme or knows what it is, familiar with it? OK. Um, so th this is a replacement for Enzyme, basically. Uh, and it also comes with these custom jest matches if you use jest um, as your assertion framework and test runner. Um, so these let your assertions be sort of more declarative, makes them a bit easier to write, easier to read and understand. So when I say I'm going to help you write better tests, what does that mean? What makes a test good? Uh, to answer this question, I'm going to ask another question. Why do we write tests in the first place? There's one main reason for writing tests, and that's that it gives us confidence in the product that we're shipping. Confidence that everything's still working as expected when we, when we make a change to the code base. So what do we not like about writing tests? Well, it can be a steep learning curve. Some complex uh, libraries like Enzyme take a little bit of time to sort of understand how to use them. Um, and it takes some effort to write these tests and effort to maintain them as well. Um, so in terms of maintenance, we, we've all been in this situation where we make a change that we think is fairly benign, should be all fine, and then the tests will fail and you're like, why? And you need to completely rewrite them in order to get them passing again. So good tests are tests that give us a lot of confidence but don't cost a lot of effort. So let's jump straight into an example of a test that isn't very good, in my opinion. And then we can see how React Testing Library might help us make it a bit better. So consider this test written with Enzyme. Um, so not, not everyone had their hands up, obviously, um, when I mentioned Enzyme. So for those who aren't familiar, without going into too much detail, it's a library for testing your React components. It allows you to render them in a few different ways. I won't go into that. And then it allows you to query them and make assertions basically about the state of your React tree. Um, so this test asserts that there's an instance of a particular co component, um, checks that it exists, and that it's received the props you expect it to receive. Has anyone written a test like this before? By show of hands, I know I have. Yeah, quite a few of us. The problem with this test, 
I can easily break the test by refactoring the component, even though the component might still behave how we expect it to. For example, this um, in sort of the middle there, this to-do list instance dot find to-do item seems fairly innocent, but perhaps I decide that that's a bit over-engineered. I don't need a component for that. I just replace it with a span or a div or whatever I like, or some other component. My test breaks. Even though the behavior of the component is still the same, the test is failing. It's what we call a false negative. Equally, the test might not fail, even if the component does actually break for the end user. Um, so in, in this example, if maybe the to-do item changes its API, so it's expecting uh, props.txt, but it changes that to you know, users children or whatever it is, um, and the to-do list doesn't update its integration, so it just totally stops working. It doesn't display anything. The test still passes, because it's checking for that to-do item, and it's checking that props.txt is, is what I passed down. But that's useless, because the, the test is, the, sorry, the component is broken. And that's a false positive. So this is essentially because we're testing the implementation of the component, rather than the result of the implementation. So why is testing implementation details bad? Um, this is from a, another article by Kent. Uh, it's a really good one, actually. Uh, it's called Testing Implementation Details. And it has loads of examples, or maybe not loads, it has a few examples, and sort of more in-depth discussion of, of this sort of problem. Um, but it's the same thing. Code may break when, you're, when you re refactor your application co code. That's a false negative. And it may not fail when you break your application code. False positives. Um, and th this is also echoed in his article about why I never use shallow rendering. Um, shallow rendering is a, a way of rendering with Enzyme, for those unfamiliar. It allows you to render a React component, and you basically get back the React components which are rendered as a result of that, the sort of the child components, um, only up to one level deep. And this really tightly couples your test to the implementation of the component you're testing. So there's a clear message here. Testing implementation details is bad because it makes our tests unreliable, which reduces our confidence, it makes them brittle, which increases the cost of maintenance. So yeah, testing implementation details is not great. Um, so when I say implementation details, what, what do I mean by that? Um, it says here, implementation details are things which users of your code will not typically use, see, or even know about. So anything that a user does know about is not an implementation detail. Anything that they don't know about probably is. So I said the user. So who is this user? That might seem like a silly question. Of course, it's the end user, the one that's using your site or your app through the browser, right? They are, of course, a user, but actually, the developer who's consuming that component that's rendering it to your page or your application, they're also a user. So they're rendering it. Um, sorry, I meant to go forwards here. The, so the developer's rendering your component. They're passing props into it. So they're, they're also a user. And another article from Kent, Avoid, Avoid the Test User, is all about this paradigm of testing for these two users, but not testing for anything else. Um, so we know who our users are, the end user and the developer. Um, and implementation details are anything that the users don't see. So let's summarize what that means. So we should be testing anything that the users are aware of. This consists of rendering the component with props, that's developer user, they see that, and basically querying and interacting with the, the rendered result. When I say querying, I mean as a user would, um, and I'll explain that a little bit more in detail later. Um, but that's the end user querying and interacting with the render rendered result. So this is what our tests should be testing. What they should not be testing, implementation details. This includes state, component names, CSS classes or selectors, anything like that. Anything that the users don't see, you know, they're not looking for a class name in your application or anything like that. 
So um, imagine your React component's a black box, and you put some props in, you get a rendered component out. Anything inside that black box is implementation. Neither the developer user nor the end user care about that. And your test shouldn't either. So with that all said, let's see how React testing library can make that test we saw just previously a bit better. So this test renders the component with some props, and it checks to see that the expected result exists in the DOM. Uh, by the way, get, get by text is specifically for finding a single element. And if it can't find it, it throws an error. So that's why we don't need an expect assertion here, because uh, the test will just fail if the element doesn't exist. So not only is this test a lot simpler to write and to understand, there's a lot less going on. But more importantly, it, it's more reliable. It won't break if we refactor the component. It means our maintenance costs are lower. That was one of the things we didn't like about writing tests. Um, and it definitely will fail if the component breaks. So that's giving us a lot more confidence. At least I think so. So the reason I love React testing libraries so much, it tries, you to, it tries to encourage you to write tests with these best practices, um, mainly writing tests that resemble how the component's actually used. So everything in the project, everything in the React testing library project tries to abide by these three principles. Number one is we should be dealing with DOM nodes rather than component instances. Number two, it should be useful for testing components in the way that the user would use it. And number three, it should be simple and flexible. Let's look at another example, ever so slightly more complex. This time we're testing an accordion component. Uh, this is the enzyme version of the test. Um, this is, I should state actually, I haven't put a link here, but this is taken from uh, I think this is the testing implementation details library, uh, sorry, article or blog post. Um, so yeah, this is testing an accordion component with Enzyme. Can anyone see what might go wrong here? I can see a few things. Um, it's, it's an incredibly brittle test, really. Uh, if we decide to refactor this component, um, maybe you can see in the first test, it's, it's looking at wrapper.state open index. That's inside the accordion component. If we decide we want to change the name of that, you know, we want to change it to I like pizza or something like that, um, this test will break. It will say, well, wrapper.state.open index is you know, not what I expect it to be. But the component still works fine. So that's our false negative. Um, we can also quite easily break this component without the test failing. So um, again, in the first test, we're getting the instance of the component, and we're calling an instance method on it. We're calling set open index to tell it, OK, I want you to change you know, the, the part of the accordion that's open, uh, just for testing purposes. And we're testing that it has a, the correct effect on the internal state. But perhaps inside the accordion component, we never call set open index, or we call it with the wrong parameters, something like that, because it's wired up incorrectly to, to the buttons or the event handlers. So this test happily tells us that everything's working fine. In fact, the component doesn't respond to the user's interactions at all. So now, with React testing library, um, we, we don't get that. Uh, sorry, my notes have for some reason disappeared from this slide. Um, Yeah, so we, we render the component, we pass in the props, and then we check that what we expect to see in the DOM is there. We say, I want to see this text. Um, and we say, I don't want to see this text because that, that item isn't, isn't open. And then we, we click on the, we try and find the, the title of the one that should be closed by the text. And we click on it, and then we check that that text is now visible. So just like the other ones, we can refactor this component as much as we like. The test won't break. So to recap, React Testing Library, it's a library for querying the DOM, or a DOM. You can do it with uh, JS DOM or in a browser, the real DOM, uh, in your tests. 
It's a replacement for enzyme. I should just say at that point, actually, it doesn't need to be a big bang replacement. There's no reason why you can't install both. Start writing your test with React Testing Library. Maybe use that Boy Scout mentality, and when you see an enzyme test and you're working on it, change it to use React Testing Library. You don't have to refactor your whole code base. No reason for that. So it helps us have confidence in our code, and it helps us reduce the cost of writing and maintaining our tests. And it does that by providing really simple APIs, and it encourages best practices. So remember, the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. Thank you. I hope you have questions. <laughs>